Article 6 in the U.S. Constitution, according to the <coughs> highly suspicious document that has been uploaded on constitution.congress.gov, it states, This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. So, in this video, in the context of this video, we should understand that this all has to do with the land. The U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and most of what we're going to look at might be presented in some light, but the very foundation of it and everything else comes down to the land and who controls the land. As an example, the use of so-called no trespassing laws, in which they will list the deprivation of property under the U.S. Constitution, well, these are used for many things, but most noticeably, the face mask requirement of COVID-19 era, the so-called pandemic, in which they were requiring you to wear face masks. Otherwise, you would get the cops called on you, essentially, for trespassing. Now, I called the police department, local police department and asked if they were going to enforce face masks, and they said no, but if somebody asks you to leave their property, then you'll be essentially quote unquote, arrested for trespassing. So the idea here is the elevation of their real estate law above all else, which in the context of the Constitution is a violation of the Ninth Amendment, which has to do with construing one section to deprive others of their legitimacy. And this is specifically done in the most obvious way of the no gun sign laws, which also use, or notices, which also use the trespassing charge to enforce them. If you go on a property and you're carrying a weapon, they'll ask you to leave, and if you don't leave, then you are quote unquote violating your trespass. Now, I'm not going to get into exactly what the word trespass means or any of that, but it all has to do with the control of the land itself and. They, that is, in, set, in essence, using the section of the Constitution, as far as they would argue it, if they were even going to argue constitutionality, uh, to violate the Second Amendment, using the deprivation of property to deprive um, the, or to infringe on the keeping and bearing of arms. However, in most cases, they don't even reference or cite the Constitution. They only ever argue it when somebody... Um, or when more likely a large number of people, not when just one individual, but a large number of people, will make an issue out of it, then they'll argue that everything they do is constitutional because they say so and all other voices are silenced. To understand how they oppose this, we are going to need to look at some old documentation. Although this isn't that old, considering it is copyrighted in 2001. But this document is the 1917 or Pio Pio Benedictine Code of Canon Law, an English translation with extensive scholarly apparatus, forward by most reverend, uh -huh. it's like the most honorable, such, so, such crap. Yes, if you have to say it, that's not true, right? John J. Myers. Dr. Edward M. Peters, Curator, Ignatius Press, San Francisco, Copyright, 2001. Now, under Contents, we have Forward, Curator's Introduction, Research in the 1970 Code in English, Acknowledgements, Illustrations, Preface. I'm pretty sure the preface is actually supposed to come before the forward, but that's just that's nonsense. Apostolic Constitution, Motu Proprio of Benedict, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go through all this stuff. This is a pretty extensive document. There's only particularly one section that's important. So to get an idea of who exactly we're dealing with, we'll go to the Motu Proprio of Benedict the 15th, Cum Iuris Canonici. 
15 September 1917 by our own motion. And this document will give you a uh, perspective about who these people are and how they think. The Commission is instituted for the authentic interpretation of the canon code. As we, a short time ago, fulfilled the expectations of the whole Catholic Church by promulgating the Code of Canon Law, which had been drawn up by order of our predecessor, Pius X, of happy memory. The welfare of the Church, and the very nature of the matter, certainly require that we should take precautions as far as we can to ensure that the stability of so great a work be not any time endangered, either by uncertain opinions, and conjectures of private persons regarding the true meaning of the canons, or by the frequent enactment of various new laws. We have therefore determined to guard against both of these dangers, and in order to do so, we now, upon our own motion from certain knowledge and after mature deliberation, do ordain and decree as follows. So basically, they're going to do exactly what they, what they said they uh, want to do guard against. But the matter of fact here in this paragraph is that they want to guard against anyone else doing it. Right? They want to be the only ones that can do essentially revisionism. And that's very important for the rest of this video. So this other stuff is interesting, but that paragraph gives you an idea of their perspective. So the most important part of this document is Canon 5, 1983, Sick 5, Canon Law Digest, blah, blah, blah. Customs presently enforce, whether universal or particular, but against the prescriptions of these canons, if they are indeed expressly reprobated, are to be corrected as a corruption of the law. Even if they are immemorial, nor are they permitted to revive in the future. Other customs, clearly centenary or immemorial, can be tolerated if ordinaries determine that, due to circumstances of person or place, they cannot be prudently removed. Other customs are considered suppressed unless the code expressly provides otherwise. So that uh, should be self-explanatory what the implications are there. This brings us to the codification and progressive development of international law. Which, of course, that name is reflected in the purpose of that canon that we just read. Here it states, according to Article 13, Paragraph 1A of the Charter of the United Nations, the General Assembly is mandated, and they mandated themselves, to encourage the progressive development of international law and its codification. The progressive development of international law encompasses the drafting of legal rules and fields that have not yet been regulated by international law or sufficiently addressed in state practice. And of course, that's up to them how they determine it, and this is just such bogus crap. In contest, the codification of international law refers to the more precise formulation and systemization of rules of international law on subjects that have already been extensively covered by state practice precedent doctrine. Codification Division of the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs. <laughs> That's a name for you. Yeah. It's the General Assembly in carrying out the above mentioned mandate, in particular by providing substantive secretariat services to relative bodies established by the Assembly, such as the International Law Commission, as well as the Assembly's Six Legal Committee, LEGAL. That makes me think of Legate and to diplomatic conferences of plenipotentiaries convened to negotiate multilateral treaties. The codification division also assists in the precise formulation and systemization of rules of international law by preparing analytical research studies in various fields of international law. Blah, blah, blah. Basically, these people are just... Uh, they're, they're just a bunch of criminals, and they have a extensive organization, and this organization here... Their purpose is, well, at least the advisory purpose there is to tell them how they can execute their mandate. And, of course, the mandate is to usurp or insurrect sovereign law of foreign lands, such as the supreme law of the land, the United States Constitution. Now, membership is particularly interesting. They don't define their terms here, <clears throat> but... Uh, with a little bit of uh, understanding, we can 
uh, devise or we can understand divine <laughs> what they actually mean. Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the statute provides that the members of the commission shall be persons of recognized competence in international law. So the important thing to note here is that the persons they're referring to do not have to be natural. There's nowhere that says they have to be natural. It just states they have to be recognized competence in international law. The members of the commission are persons who possess recognized competence and qualifications of both doctrinal and practical aspects of international law. That's, of course, their international law. The membership of the commission often reflects a broad spectrum of expertise and practical experience with the field of international law, including international dispute settlement procedures. Members are drawn from the various segments of the international legal community, such as academia, the diplomatic corps, government ministries, and international organizations. Since the members are often persons working in the academic and diplomatic fields with outside professional responsibilities, the commission is able to proceed with, with its work in close touch with the realities of international life. As in the case of the members of the International Court of Justice, they were sanctioned, by the way, the members of the commission sit in their individual capacity and not as representatives of their governments. And, of course, that's the International Criminal Court, because they're criminal. <laughs> In addition, the members of the commission cannot be replaced by alternate nits or advisors. No two members of the commission may be nationals of the same state, Article 2, Paragraph 2, and mind you, a corporation is considered a national of a state. In case of dual nationality, a person is deemed to be a national of the state which he or she ordinarily exercises civil and political rights, Article 2, Paragraph 3. And uh, don't be misled by that he or she there. They are talking about juridical entities. Eligibility for election is not restricted to nations of member states of the United Nations, but no national of any non-member state has ever been elected to the commission. This poss possibility would seem to be diminished as the membership of the United Nations increases and becomes almost universal. So now we'll look at yet another one of their mechanisms, the International Foundation for Electoral an interesting note on this website is that in the regions where it states where they work, you should notice that there's apparently only one dot under past programming in the United States, as well as in Canada. There are quite a lot throughout Mexico and the Caribbean of current field offices and current activities. But there's not actually as many operating today, apparently, because we notice there's a lot more of the orange, which states past programming, and I would think that that would mean that they're no longer there. They were there before, but that might not be what it means. But it is interesting to note that the majority of North Africa is blank. A lot of South America is blank. Uh, pretty much the entire northern hemisphere around Russia is blank. Uh, most of China is blank, and most of Australia is blank, as well as the United States and Canada. However, that map that we looked at is contrary to their about section. It states, IFES advances democracy for a better future. We collaborate with civil society, public institutions, and the private sector to build resilient democracies that deliver for everyone. Yeah more of their coded language there, using code in a different context. Here. As a global leader in the promotion and protection of democracy, our technical assistance and applied research develop trusted electoral bodies capable of conducting credible elections. Of course, they mean trusted by them, not trusted by us. Credible elections mean elections they control, not ones we do. Effective and accountable governing stakeholders. All right, there you go, your stakeholders which of course means foreign investors, civic and political processes in which all people can safely and equally participate in innovative ways in which technology and data can positively serve elections in democracy. Yeah, so that's all about getting a um, stronger hold on the elections, as it were. Since 1987, IFES worked in more than 145 countries. From developing to mature democracies, IFES is a global nonpartisan organization based in Arlington, Virginia, USA. It registers a nonprofit organization 501c3 under the United States tax code. Based in Arlington, Virginia, USA. I 
For one, doubt that. And two, this is definitely not a quote-unquote United States entity. It is definitely not a U.S. citizen or a national of the United States. It is most certainly a member, as it were, in the United Nations Code Commission. Now, the General Code, which that name is important, is a subsidiary, right? We see at the bottom it says Copyright 2024 General Code LLC, a subsidiary, the International Code Council. So what exactly is the General Code? I have covered somewhat the International Code Council. Of course, they're tied to all the same bogus garbage as all the international crap, as some would refer to as globalism. Of course, the important thing about that is that it's, it's a handful of foreign actors seeking to essentially make war through other means. So, well, actually, yeah, in some cases, in many cases, the use of arms, but puppet governments to, using the arms and, and uh, quote-unquote human resources, puppet governments and stuff like that. But their uh, objective, of course, is in fact to institute insurrection and to usurp all laws that are not theirs, as we read in that canon code, this all goes together. They're all the same people, and all these organizations and structures are essentially enemy institutions, and they're enemies of every single concept, tradition, idea of sovereignty, domestic or otherwise, across the nation. These people are inimical to everyone else who's not them. And that's becoming more apparent today than it has been necessarily in the past. Although that's a whole other topic. <laughs> Here it states, the general code's unique expertise and code-centric solutions simplify how local governments and their constituents find access and share information. Empowering communities to work better together. <laughs> By intelligently connecting vital code content in the digital environment, communities can work more cohesively to effectively overcome challenges and create greater opportunities for growth of course, their communities, contrary to the natural communities, right? The natural persons. With 60 years of experience, 4,000 local government clients in 44 states trust general code with their municipal code, zoning code, and building code content. So, as I said before, this all has to do with control of the land. As a member of the International Code Council Family of Solutions, we offer more forward-thinking technologies than ever before. Let us help you better leverage your municipal content and grow a stronger, more connected community. So the important thing to, to understand here is that this is a foreign organization and their enemy. Anybody at all across the United States or foreign countries, anyone at all that seeks to enforce codes is an enemy agent, whether they know it or not. So, in the context of this video and what we just looked at, we can get a better understanding of the Executive Order 13848 imposing certain sanctions in the event of foreign interference in a United States election. Of course, the interference has been going on for quite a long time. <clears throat> By authority vested in me as the President of the Constitution, the laws of the United States of America, including the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, and the National Emergencies Act, uh, blah, 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 I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, find that the ability of persons located in whole or in substantial part, and notice that persons does not specify natural, Outside the United States to interfere in or undermine public confidence in United States elections, including through the unauthorized accessing of election and campaign infrastructure, or the covert distribution of propaganda and disinformation constitutes an unusual and extraordinary threat to our national security and foreign policy of the United States. And who did all that? Well, the people or the persons that we looked at before, the non-natural ones. Of course, there were the natural ones which are the only ones you can really hold accountable, but they hide behind all these uh, fake and bogus juridical person. Although there has been no evidence of a foreign power altering the outcome or vote tabulation in the United States election, foreign powers have historically sought to exploit America's free and open political system. In recent years, the proliferation of digital services and internet-based communications has created suit blah, blah, blah. 
of course there has been evidence, but anyway, um, so that's not important. So, uh, the rest of this order is not important. Okay, so here we go. Section 2A. All property and interests in property that are in the United States, that hereafter come within the United States, or that are hereafter come within the possession or control of any United States person, or the following persons blocked, it may not be transferred, paid, exported, withdrawn, or otherwise dealt in. Any foreign person determined by the Secretary of the Treasury, station with blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, to have directly or indirectly engaged in, sponsored, concealed, or otherwise been complicit in foreign interference in a United States election. Two, to have materially assisted, sponsored, or provided financial material, technological support for or goods or services to or in support of any activity described in subsection AI of this section or any person whose property and interests and property are blocked pursuant to this order. Or, uh, well, that's three, I, I, I. To be owned or controlled by or to have acted or purported to act for or on behalf of directly or directly any person whose property or interest in property are blocked pursuant to this order. And that would be every single municipal corporation across the country because they're all enforcing these codes, which are all property of international interests seeking to undermine and, as they quote, uh, rewrite the laws which they consider to be um, well, the wording in the canon code. So here's another section that's kind of interesting, section 3B. Secretary of State, and of course, naturally, these people are all foreign agents. They're not going to carry out the mandates in these, but the point thing here is what it's describing, what is to be done to these individuals, and the fact that there are, in the wording in these executive orders, if the individuals who are cited, or if they do or don't, either way, it's open as well for others whose job it is to do this type of thing, which is pretty much everyone across the nation that is not a foreign actor, to execute this executive order, right? Like here it states, um, other appropriate agencies. Well. There's many appropriate agencies, including the militia, which apparently has not been properly administered yet. Anyway, shall jointly prepare a recommendation for the president as to whether additional sanctions against foreign persons may be appropriate, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, appropriate and consistent with applicable law, both sanctioned with respect to the largest business entities licensed or domiciled in a country whose government authorized, directed, sponsored, or supported election interference, including at least one entity from each of the following sectors, financial services, defense, energy, technology, and transportation, or if applicable to that country's largest business entities, sectors of comparable strategic significance to that foreign government. The recommendation shall include an assessment of the effect of the recommended sanctions on the economic and national security interests of the United States and its allies. Any recommended sanctions shall be appropriately calibrated to the scope of the foreign interference identified and may include one or more of the following with respect to each targeted foreign person. Blocking and prohibiting all transactions in a person's property and interests in property subject to United States jurisdiction. Export license restrictions under any statute or regulation that requires the prior review and approval of the United States government as a condition for the export or re-export of goods or services. Prohibitions on in United States financial institutions making loans or providing credit to a person. Restrictions on transactions in foreign exchange in which a person has any interest. Prohibitions on transfers or credit payments between financial institutions or by through or to any financial institution for the benefit of a person. Prohibitions on United States persons investing in or purchasing equity or debt of a person. Exclusion of a person's alien corporate office in the United States. So all of these things are methods that need in general enforcement across the United Nations to be put in against all the actors that are doing this stuff. And of course, the assistance of these people is in fact aiding and abetting an enemy operation to usurp the law, right? That's the, possibly the highest and most heinous crime 
that anybody could do. And sure, there's a lot that maybe do it uh, to an extent ignorantly, but either way, this is a um, an issue that needs to be fixed, and hopefully soon, considering the fact that these elements are attempting to uh, create a scorched earth tactic, as it were, using every resource available to destroy what they can while they can. In continuation, uh, imposition on a person's alien principal executive officers of any of the sanctions described in this section or any other measures authorized by law, which of course one of those would be a bill of attainder for treason, and naturally a punishment that is neither cruel nor unusual. Anyway, uh, there's a, a lot more to this order, but I think it's uh, it's important to understand what this executive order is seeking to do. Target the property of every single foreign operation that is attempting to undermine election interference, right? That's every municipal uh, corporation, everyone. They all have election councils and committees. That all of those election councils and committees carry out the mandates that we looked at before of the global international structure. That's election interference. That is interfering in the domestic ability to elect or choose. And they're doing it based off of the revision of laws that are deemed to be, well, again, the wording in the Vatican Code, right? Now, we also have the General Code of Operating Rules. This is from Wikipedia. The General Code of Operating Rules, GCOR, is a set of operating rules for railroads in the United States. The GCOR is used by Class 1 railroads west of Chicago, most of the Class 2 railroads, and many short-line railroads. Of course, this General Code, right, is a General Code. That name, General Code LLC, obviously being a subsidiary of the International Code Council, here we have the General Code of Operating Rules. Sub-railroads of the Northeast United States follow NORAC, while Canada and Mexico have their own set of operating rules that govern their railroad operations. The GCOR, and of course there's no passenger rail in Mexico right now. The GCOR rules are intended to enhance railroad safety, rules cover employee responsibility, blah blah blah, nobody cares. But that word there is important. Also, you have air brake train handling instructions and general orders, uh, special instructions, timetables, and general order can modify or amend the general code of operating rules. Now, general order, as far as I'm aware, is something that is given by a military commander to troops about what the purpose of a particular operation, mission, or otherwise uh, event is. They issue a general order. The fact that this is talking about the issuance of general orders should be very important for the context of understanding that this is a enemy foreign operation and all your city councils, all your attorneys, anybody at all who tries to enforce these foreign codes is one of the components in that system. Like I said, some of them might be ignorant. And they, they still are carrying out the interests of enemy, foreign enemy structures. In the United States, of course, we have uh, an example here is the establishment of the Virginia Code Commission. The Commission on Code Recodification was created in 1946 as a permanent commission of the legislative branch, obviously carrying out what was listed in that canon code that we read before. In 1948, the commission was renamed the Virginia Code Commission. Of course, it was constantly shifting and hiding and trying to make it really difficult to research the fact that they are fraudulent usurpers of the law. They are not the law. They are illegitimate pretenders. The original purpose of the commission was to create the 1950 Code of Virginia by codifying the Acts of Assembly of 1948 and all statutes enacted prior to and subsequent to 1948. So again, carrying out the mandate of the Vatican there. Today, the Commission's duties set on Chapter 15 of Title 30 of the Code of Virginia include annually supervising the codification of the statutes after each session of the General Assembly. 
revising and recodifying individual titles of the Code of Virginia, reviewing the Code of Virginia and Acts of Assembly to identify obsolete provisions, arranging the codification and incorporation into the Code of Virginia of all general, special, and limited compacts to which the Commonwealth of Virginia is a party, compiling and codifying all the administrative regulations of state agencies of Virginia Administrative Code, overseeing the biweekly publication of the Virginia Register of Publications. Now we come to the General Code of the State of Ohio, and of course these are all being done in the early 1900s. And, well, I looked as far as these uh, general codes of the state of Ohio go, uh, published in 1910. However, they are carrying out that mandate that we read before, and that's very apparent. But what's interesting is that the early focus is on the land, and the land is the foundation, and still is the foundation to all of this fraudulent uh, usurpation and domination. Now, the land, the reason why that's so important is because they essentially have elevated the interests of foreign interest in real estate as the supreme law of the land, which is actually in, is contrary to the U.S. Constitution. So the U.S. Constitution, according to it, is the supreme law of the land. But what is actually enforced is real estate investment law is the supreme law of the land. Everything else is subject to that. It all has to do with who controls administration of the land. And as we can understand with that executive order, all of their property is to be seized. Right? That's part of the sanction, is the seizure of all their property. And that anybody who assists them to also have their property seized. Anyway, General Code of the State of Ohio being an act entitled, An Act to Revise and Consolidate the General Statutes of Ohio, passed by the General Assembly of Ohio, February 14, 1910, and approved by the Governor, February 15, 1910, and including therewith in a fourth volume, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation of 1777, Constitution of the United States of 1787, Ordinance of 1787, Constitutions of Ohio, and a topical index to said act. Now, the only reason why they're including all those documents is because those documents that they included were forgeries, and they were intended to give uh, an apparent authoritative weight to their fraud. Anyway, published by the Commissioners of Public Printing of Ohio, pursuant to an act entitled An Act to Supplement Section 7, blah, 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 blah. This is four volumes. This one's volume two, and it's published in 1910 Cincinnati, W.H. Uh, Anderson Company Law Book Publisher. So, chapter one, definitions. Here we get a clear definition of how the word person is used. The word person is used in this title includes firms, companies, associations, and corporations. Words in the singular number including the plural number, and words in the plural number include the singular number, and words in the masculine gender include the feminine and neuter genders. So remember in the executive order, not in the executive order, in the... Uh, it, I think it was the International Code Council. No, it was the, the UN uh, outfit, one of their many creepo persons that are, aren't real people, uh, said he or she, right? Here it says the masculine gender include the feminine and neuter genders. That's according, that's applied to a non-natural person where they apply the genders equally. So you can say he, she, it, them, they, whatever, it doesn't matter because it's a corporate entity. It's not a natural person. So yes, you can refer to them with genders and that's part, of course, of their ability to hide what they're really doing by being able to refer to a corporation as a she or a he or whatever. Anyway, section 5321, the terms personal tax and tax on personal property are so used include all taxes, excepting only the tax upon real estate specifically as such. The term real property and land as so used include not only the land itself, whether laid out in town, lots, or otherwise, with all things contained therein, but also unless otherwise specified, all buildings, structures, improvements, and fixtures of whatever kind they're on, and all rights and privileges belonging or appertaining thereto. Right, this is, uh, like I said, it's all about the land. The term investment and bonds, as so used, includes all monies and bonds, certificates of indebtedness, or other evidence of indebtedness of whatever kind, which of course could include forgeries, right, fraudulent 
documents of fraud because it says whatever kind. Whether issued by incorporated or unincorporated companies, towns, cities, villages, townships, counties, states, or other incorporations, or by the United States held by persons residing in this state, whether for themselves or others. That definition kind of creepy as far as the investment in bonds goes. That really opens it up to all sorts of things there, with their skeevy definition. The term investment in stocks, as so used, includes all monies invested in the capital or stock of a bank, whether incorporated under the laws of the state or the United States, or an association, corporation, joint stock company, or other company, the capital stock of which is or may be divided into shares, which are transferable by each owner without the consent of the other partners or stakeholders, stockholders, for the taxation of which no special provision is made by law held by persons residing within the state, either for themselves or others. Now, it should be important to note that when, what they're talking about here likely is a different type of investment in stock as far as we're aware. They're talking about real stock, they're talking about tangible, say gold or silver, something that is real, right? There it states it's the stock of a bank and monies. So that would have been gold or silver at the time, 1910, right? They didn't get us on this, this phony garbage until later <clears throat> as far as the, uh, fake currency that we have goes. Uh, so the shares is a share of an entire stock. So let's say you put in a stock of gold into a bank and a portion of that is a share. Nowadays we have shares that have no value, right? They're, they're, they're just air, right? They're, they're, they mean nothing. You have a share in a corporation and that corporation's value is based off of all kinds of arbitrary nonsense nowadays because people don't understand that it is tangible monetary value of physical asset which the paper is supposed to represent not the paper itself but that's how things are today anyway when you have the usurpation of foreign property investors that's what they really want is the land because it's whoever controls the land controls the law if you are the lord of the land, you are the law of the land, and nothing else uh, contrary to that uh, will be enforced practically. You might be illegitimate, but it requires the actual counter enforcement to reestablish the legitimate. Anyway, the term personal property is so used includes first every tangible thing being the subject of ownership, whether animal or inanimate, or animate or inanimate, other than money, and not for a part of a parcel of real property as here and before defined. Second, the capital stock, undivided profits, and all other means not forming part of the capital stock of every company, whether incorporated or unincorporated, and every share, portion, or interest in such stocks, profits, or means by whatsoever name designed exclusive, inclusive of every share or portion right or interest in either legal or equitable in, and to every ship, vessel, or boat, or whatsoever name or description used in or designed to be used either exclusively or partially in navigating any of the waters within or boarding bordering on the state, whether such ship, vessel, or boat is within the jurisdiction of the state or elsewhere, and whether it has been enrolled, registered, or licensed at a collector's office or within a collection district of the state or not, third money loaned on pledge or mortgage of real estate, although a deed or other instrument may have been given for it, if between the parties there too, it is considered as security merely. So here they're usurping the Constitution in so many different ways with these definitions. But this is just the definitions. But it should be noted that they're using the word here, collector. Now, the revenue collectors of the, pre, of the colonial period, they made up a primary reason for the war for independence, among many other things. There were, as it said, swarms of agents being sent to eat out their, their supply, their, their you know, food and, and money and everything. That's what we have again. We have foreign investors sending swarms of agents to eat everything out, and these are the collectors or revenue collectors. There's a, a lot talked about this in the book Trade and Empire, which is particularly useful, and I mentioned that book in a few other videos. Anyway, the term money or monies, as so used, includes any surplus or undivided profits held by societies, 
Poor savings are banks having no capital stock, gold, and silver coin. Banknotes of solvent banks in actual possession and every deposit, which the person owing, holding, and trust are having a beneficial interest therein, is entitled to withdraw in money on demand. Huh. Well, that's a confusing definition there. So, I'm not sure what they're saying exactly. It sounds like they're saying that it's banks that have no capital stock, gold and silver coin. So money in this context is only considered money if the bank issuing it doesn't actually have any gold or silver coin on stock, which would be an interesting fraud. But there you get it in that singular definition right there. This also gives you an understanding of what exactly is a land bank. <laughs> of course, the land being used as quote unquote collateral or the stock, not of gold and silver coin. So there's all kinds of interesting banking schemes and subversions that have taken place because uh, the U.S. Constitution provides only for gold and uh, silver coin in the payment of debts. And there's, old, of course, only one tax enumerated in the U.S. Constitution. All these other taxes are fraudulent, and they don't even reference the Constitution. They reference their codes, their foreign codes. The term credits, as so used, means the excess of the sum of all legal claims and demands, whether for money or other valuable thing, or for labor or service, due or to become due to the person liable to pay taxes thereon, including deposits in banks or with persons in and out of the state, other than such as are held to be money as herein before defined when adding together estimating every such claim or demand, as its true value in money over and above the sum of legal bona fide debts owing by such persons. I wonder in what context they're using money, probably in that really confusing one right above it. Anyway, in making up the sum of such debts owing, there shall be taken into account an obligation to a mutual insurance company, nor an unpaid subscription to the capital stock of a joint stock company, nor a subscription for religious, scientific, literary, or charitable purpose, nor an acknowledgement of indebtedness unless founded on some consideration actually received and believed at the time of making such acknowledgement to be full consideration therefore, nor an acknowledgement made for the purpose of diminishing the amount of credits to be listed for taxation, nor a greater amount of portion of a liability is surety than the person required to make the statement of such credits believes that such surety is in equity bound and will be compelled to pay or to contribute in case there are no securities. Pensions receivable from the United States shall not be held to be credits. No person shall be required to take into account in making up the amount of credits a greater portion of any credits than he believes will be received or can be collected or a greater portion of an obligation given to secure the amount of payment of rent and the amount that has been that has accrued on any lease and remains unpaid. So this particular section is written in such a confusing matter matter because they're trying to hide what they're doing here. What they're doing here is particularly heinous, and I don't really want to get into all the details and particulars of this this section. Uh, it's a lot to unravel. But it is important to note that they're here they're referencing rents and leases. A lot of what goes on today, which is contrary to the law, is signed into lease agreements. So the people who sign that lease agreement will follow along with the lease agreement out of fear of the removal of the land or their license to operate on that land. And that's how you get so many hidden use your patience of law where the person who's really doing it isn't going to get held accountable it's the person who is the face of the one doing it who is forced to sign these lease agreements in fact all these lease agreements are pretty much going to be the same they're all going to violate things specific things especially when it comes to the defense of the nation such as the keeping and bearing of firearm so on to chapter two and we're on, we're, this is the last part this uh, document's really long so we're just going to cover chapter two a taxable property, property subject to taxation. All real or personal property in this state belonging to individuals or corporations and, and all monies, credits, investments, and bonds, stocks, or otherwise of persons residing in the state shall be subject to taxation, except only such property as may be expressly exempted therefrom. Such property, monies, credits, and investments shall be entered on the list of taxable property as 
prescribed in this title. Prescribed, it's an interesting word there. Section 5329, all tracts of land set apart for school or ministerial purposes and sold by and under authority of law. Right, that's their law. And all lands which are hereafter sold by the United States shall be subject to taxation as other lands in the state immediately after such sale. School or ministerial lands shall not be sold for taxes until the purchase money, therefore, is fully paid, but shall be returned as delinquent and continue on the duplicate with the taxes of each year charged thereon and added to the tax and penalty due when they become delinquent and until payment is made by the purchaser of his assigns of such purchase money with the tax and penalty, or the lands are resold by the county on or pursuant to the laws provided for the sale of such lands. Now, of course, this is an old document, apparently, and we are not taught how to understand the language they're using here. So it would probably have been convoluted even for the time, but now it takes on a different nature when a lot of us have different understandings of these words, and when we see how they're used here, it looks like they're being used incorrectly in context. That's because we've been taught different contexts for these words and for the reason that they don't want people unraveling and figuring out that their entire structure is a insurrection, it's a usurpation, and it's illegitimate. Also, it's a foreign enemy operation. And here's another sec subsection, I suppose, for the property subject to taxation. Collateral inheritances. All property within, in the jurisdiction of the state and any interests therein, whether belonging to inhabitants of the state or not, right, not inhabitants of the state. By the way, jurisdiction is a declared oath, not a written one. And whether tangible or intangible, which pass by will or by the intra interstate laws of this state or by deed, grant, sale, or gift, made or intended to take effect in possession or enjoyment after the death of the grantor to a person in trust or otherwise, other than to or for the use of the father, mother, husband, wife, brother, sister, niece, nephew, lineal descendant, adopted child, or person recognized in his adopted child, and made a legal heir under the provisions of a statute of the state, or the lineal descendants thereof, or the lineal descendants of an adopted child, the wife, widow of a son, the husband of the daughter of a descendant, which shall be liable to a tax of 5% of its value above the sum of $200, 75% of such tax shall be for in the use of the state and 25% for the use of the county herein it is collected. <clears throat> All administrators, executors, trustees, and such grantee under a conveyance made during the grantor's life shall be liable for such taxes with lawful interest as hereinafter provided <clears throat> until they have been paid as hereinafter directed such taxes shall become due and payable immediately upon the death of the decedent and shall at once become a lien upon the property and be and remain a lien until paid. And that, right there, is a primary mechanism to usurp and steal the land from its rightful owners. So, uh, to go on to a different part of the subsection, section 535, taxes imposed by this subdivision of this chapter shall be paid into the treasury of the county in which the court have a jurisdiction of the state or counts in situated by the executors, administrators, trustees, or other persons charged with the payment thereof. If such taxes are not paid within one year after the death of the decedent, interest at the rate of 8% shall be thereafter charged and collected thereon, and if not paid at the expiration of 18 months after such death, the prosecuting attorney of the county wherein said taxes remain unpaid shall institute the necessary proceedings to collect taxes in the court of common pleas of the county, after first being notified in writing of the probate judge of the county of non-payment thereof. The probate judge shall give such notice in writing if the taxes are paid before the expiration of one year after the death of the decedent, a discount of 1% per month for each full month that payment has been made prior to the expiration of the year shall be allowed to the amount of such taxes. So this is particularly obvious why in Ohio specifically, but probably in other parts of the country as well. We find a lot of these attorneys in small name towns, right on a map you have big name, medium name, and small names, so all the small name towns. All the positions listed here, right? Municipal judge uh, or for the common pleas court, 
uh, for the county. Uh, the probate judge and the, the prosecuting attorney or the law director, they're all estate-focused attorneys. They're all attorneys that focus on estate law. Even the prosecutors, right? The municipal and prosecutors, the one that's supposed to prosecute crime, so to speak, all of them are focused on estate, and this is the reason why. It all has to do with the taking of the land for those foreign revisers of law so that they can control it and they can, practically speaking, enforce foreign domination on U.S. soil um, and, of course, every other country's soil, thus usurping and taking away the legitimacy of their sovereign independence, which for countless generations of thousands or more than thousands, millions of people have died fighting for against this, this very thing. This was the reason for the war for independence, and it appears that we need to have another one to kick this crap out and to uh, arrest or stop, arrest being the French for stop, stop these operations from continuing and causing further damage. Okay, so the next part is section 5343. Here it talks about how they determine value. The value of such property subject to said tax shall be its actual market value as found by the probate court. If the state through the prosecuting attorney of the proper county or the person interested in succession to the property applies to the court, it shall appoint three disinterested persons who being first warned shall view and appraise such property at its actual market value for the purposes of this tax and make return thereof to the court. The return may be accepted by the court in a like manner as the original inventory of the state is accepted. And if so accepted, it shall be binding upon the person by whom the tax is to be paid and upon the state. The fees of the appraisers shall be fixed by the probate judge and be paid out of the county treasury upon the warrant of the county auditor. In case of an annuity or life estate, the value thereof shall be determined by the so-called actuaries combined experiences tables of 5% compound interest. So of course, what they're doing is illegitimate and criminal, and it's done based off of foreign interest. But to understand what's practically going on here, we have a good idea of why property value is so inflated today. With this mechanism here still in place, the property value will not diminish. It will only rise because the rising of property value relates to the fraudulent property tax as listed here. So if you have across the so-called real estate market, which isn't really a market, it's a monopoly, they keep the prices high across the board while they can leverage higher taxes on everybody's property because that's quote unquote market value, right? So that's what they're doing today. And this section right here explains why. Okay, so moving on to the section, second subset. And all this stuff is interesting uh, as far as a explanation of where, where we've come and how we got here. Anyway, exempt property. Public schoolhouses and houses used exclusively for public worship, the books and furniture therein, and the ground attached to such buildings, necessary for the proper occupancy, use and enjoyment thereof, and not least or otherwise used with view to the profit, public colleges, and ac academics, and all buildings connected therewith, and all lands connected with public institutions of learning. Notice that it states all lands connected with public institutions of learning. One has to wonder what their rather broad definition of connected would be. I mean, we don't really have to wonder because we see it today with the universities imposing all kinds of crap on all the surrounding areas. Anyway, not used with a view to profit shall be exempt from taxation. This section shall not extend to leasehold estates or real property held under the authority of a college or university of learning in the state, but leaseholds or other estates or property, real or personal, that rents, issues, profits, and income of which is given to a city village, school district, or sub-district in the state exclusively for the use, endowment, or support of schools for the free education of youth without charge. Ha ha ha. 
what a joke, shall be exempt from taxation as long as such property or the rents, issues, profits, or income thereof is used and exclusively applied for the support of free education by such village, district, or sub-district. That, of course, just means they have to claim it's used for that. It's just take a money launder and wash it and I'll do all this crap and easily sidestep that nonsense. But, of course, we have to understand that these so-called laws are being written by enemy agents of foreign organizations to implement that decree from the Vatican Code. Uh, lands used exclusively, uh, exclusively as graveyards or grounds for burying the dead, except such as are held by persons, company, or corporations with a view to profit or for the purpose of speculating and sale thereof, shall be exempt from taxation. Real or personal property belonging exclusively to the state or United States shall be exempt from taxation. Buildings belonging to counties and used for holding courts and for jails or county offices with the ground not exceeding 10 acres in any county on which such buildings are erected shall be exempt from taxation. Lands, houses, and other buildings belonging to a county, township, city, or village used exclusively for the accommodation and support of the poor and property belonging to institutions of public charity only shall be exempt from taxation. Buildings belonging to and used exclusively for armory purposes by lawfully organized military organizations which are fully armed and equipped at their own expense and lawfully made subject to all calls of the governor for troops in case of war, right, insurrection, or invasion in the land owned and used for its as sites for the armory buildings of such military organization, not least or otherwise used, with a view to profit and monies and credits appropriate solely to sustain and belonging exclusively to such organizations shall be exempt from taxation. And that course section is about taking over the military force, the ability to wield arms and use them, and putting it in the hands of foreign agents. That's what that section's about. Pretty obviously. Fire engines, property, and other implements used for the extinguishment of fires with the buildings used exclusively for the safekeeping thereof and for the meeting of fire companies, whether belonging to a township, city, or village, or to a fire company organized there, and shall be exempt from taxation. Of course, all the exemptions from taxation all tell you which components they're seeking to erect for their control. And anyone that is imposed with taxation are the elements that they're seeking to take the land from. Market houses, public squares, or other public grounds of a city, village, or township house or halls used exclusively for public purposes erected by taxation for such purposes, notwithstanding that parts thereof may be lawfully leased, shall be exempt from taxation. <coughs> Works, machinery, pipelines, fixtures belonging to city or village and used exclusively for conveying water to it for heating or lighting shall be exempt from taxation. Stocks or certificates of a stock in a corporation or railroad company owned by a county, township, city, or village or the money to acquire, which was originally raised by taxation upon such county, township, city, or village shall be exempt from taxation. Funds raised and set apart for the purpose of building monuments to the soldiers of the state and monuments and monumental buildings shall be exempt from taxation. A resident of the state may deduct a sum not exceeding $100 to be exempt from taxation from the aggregate listed value of his taxable personal property of any kind except dogs, of which he is the actual owner. Lands held and used as the place of interment of a distinguished deceased person and as the place of a monument or memorial to such person is blah, blah, blah. Uh, real estate held or occupied by an association or corporation organized or incorporated in the laws of the state relative to soldiers, memorial associations, monumental buildings associations, or cemetery associations, or corporations, which in the opinion of the trustees, directors, or managers thereof is necessary and proper to carry out the object intended for such association or corporation shall be exempt from taxation. Lands in the state in which are situated prehistoric earthworks or upon which was erected and still stands in historic building, which is preserved in commemoration of historic events in the settlement and development of the state, and which are purchased by any persons, associations, or company for the purpose of the preservation of such earthworks or historic buildings, and are not held for profit but dedicated to public use as prehistoric parks or as historic grounds, shall be exempt from taxation. The owners of such prehistoric parks or historic grounds may establish reasonable rules governing access thereto. And this just goes on and on. Um, this is interesting. The real or personal property belonging to an incorporated post of the Grand Army of the Republic, Union, Veterans Union, Grand Lodge of the Free and Accepted Masons, Grand Lodge of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, Grand Lodge of the Knights of Pythias, Association of the Exclusive Benefit Use and Care of Aged, Infirm, and Dependent Women, a Religious or Sick Secret, 
Benevolent organizations maintaining a lodge system, an incorporated association of ministers of any church or incorporated association of commercial travel men, an association which is intended to create a fund or is used or intended to be used for the care and maintenance of indigent soldiers of the late war, indigent members of said organizations, and the widows, orphans, and beneficiaries of the deceased members of such organizations and not operated with a view to profit or having as their principal object the issuance of insurance certificates of membership and the interest or income derived therefrom shall not be taxable and the trustees of any such organization shall be required to return or list such property for taxation. Money, funds, or credits belonging to the representative body of Indiana Meeting of Friends or the religious society known as the German Baptists or Dunkers in the state which monies, funds, or credits of the income therefrom are exclusively used for the support of the poor of such denomination, society, or congregation shall be exempt from taxation. The person or persons having a care and supervision of such monies, funds, or credits shall not be required to return or list them for taxation. Now, of course, most of us, when we read this, we're trying to look at this and say, oh, well, these are nice charities. They're all about giving things to the poor people. Well, the other shoe to that is that they want everyone to be poor. They want you to owe nothing and be happy about it, right? This all has to do entirely with control and taking from the legitimate and heirs and owners of land and putting everything into the control and the domination of the land by foreign investors. That's what all this is about, which uh, I hope that I've proved in this video.